Welcome everyone. We're going to have our keynote presentation for the Monday Stereoscopic Displays and Applications Conference. It's my great pleasure to introduce David Chavez, who is CTO of ZSpace, just down the 101 at uh, Sunnyvale. Bjorn, John Stern and myself had the, uh, the great uh, um, privilege to go down there and visit just after the conference last year. So um, we had a a personal tour of their different products and um, if you're here on Tuesday evening for our demonstration session you'll see uh, at least three ZSpace screens on, on, uh, on show so please make sure you have the opportunity to, uh, um, to see those screens if you haven't seen the ZSpace displays before. Um, Dave's presentation is titled Stereoscopic Displays, Tracking, Interaction, Education and the Web. Dave has been um, working in this area for 20 years in startup companies and uh, working with technologies from um, DSM research to laptops, printers, PDAs and smartphones. He's been working with, uh, in various positions, um, working with various companies including Go, EO, Hewlett Packard and Hansfring. And uh, uh, it's my great pleasure to um, have Dave give this keynote presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for coming. Really happy to be here. Really happy to talk to you about this, about this technology, the decisions we made, the risks we took with it, and um, uh, very interested to uh, see reactions. And, and uh, I'm really proud of this stuff. As Andrew said, I've been building things in Silicon Valley for 30 years, working on product development teams, and this is certainly the most meaningful thing I've ever, I've ever worked on. I'm going to talk to you about. Um, you know, to try, to try to describe what it is, as, as Andrew points out, you really need to kind of see it, uh, talk about uh, why I think it's important, talk about, and, and, and where it's going. So we have to start off with a kind of brief tutorial on, on VR. I'm sure many of you have, um, probably most of you have, have tried uh, HMDs and tried the different technologies. You, know, you also know then, too, that the, that the idea has been around for a long time, right? Uh, uh, Sutherland in the 60s was doing this. He strapped a couple of CRTs on the side of his head, put some optics, had a tracking system. I think that's some kind of ultrasonic transducer system up on the ceiling to keep track of uh, head movements and orientation. And the computational power of the day allowed him to render a wireframe right in front so they could kind of look around at it. So the ideas, of, of course, are uh, pretty old. We, we took a stereoscopic display and uh, wrapped some things around it. So the, uh, you know, the stereoscopic display is a the binocular vision piece. We do it uh, much like the projector, the stereo projector that's going to be used for the 3D theater here coming up. There's a, uh, uh, in addition to the LCD panel and a, and a backlight, there's what we call a polarization switch. It's, a, it's an active retarder. And it works by uh, uh, having a, a quarter wave plate there in front, and there's an extra LCD there in front, which uh, uh, polarizes the light coming from the LCD from the LCD panel. And then when it gets it at the right axis, it retards it in one way or the other, and we get a circularly polarized left or right, depending on which eye we're intending to project the image to. And as you can guess in a VR system, it's very important to get the left image to the left eye and the right image, right image to a right eye. Now it. It's an important engineering decision because this is expensive. This is a, an extra LCD here. This is so, so we already had an LCD image panel. And if you want to make a lot of these things and you want to commercialize a product, you don't usually want to slap two LCDs together. It's, 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 a, it's expensive. But the result, the reason we made that decision is that the eyewear is very light. The eyewear is similar, very similar to the eyewear that you're using here in the theater. There are no active electronics in it. And that's a pretty important choice, as you'll see. Pretty important decision, as we'll talk about in a little bit. Another piece that's got to go along with a convincing, comfortable VR system. By the way, comfort was a number one design objective for this whole thing. So I can go back to that, to that active retarder in front. The, 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 the fact that the user wears these super light glasses is really important to the comfort element. If you compare that to a Microsoft HoloLens or some of the other HMD, equipment, you, I, th I think you'll agree. 
Motion parallax is a, is a big deal, and of course, in real life, whenever we move our head back and forth, we get this instantaneous feedback. There's, there's no delay. Uh, everything moves in relation to where it is in, in the depth field, and that's a very important part of our visual input in our visual perceptive system. So we do that, we, to do that, we have a tracking system. You might have noticed on those glasses, there were some markers, that's how we do it. We have some retroreflective markers, some IR illuminators on the, on the system. And then with the position and orientation, we get this six degrees of freedom information about the, about the eyewear, and also that stylus. That stylus, the, track, the, the, the tracked interaction device, it actually has a, uh, iner some inertial components in it too, so we fuse all that information together to give real-time interaction device, inter interaction information in the scene. So, and that's a pretty important piece because for a long time, it, it, it's, it's pretty common for people to, 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 to kind of reach into the scene and reach, in, reach into the world and, and interact with it. If you're gonna build one of these VR, AR things, there turn out to just be a few ways to do it. On the left column there is the HMD, that's the AR and the VR column where, uh, where, where the, 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 the VR version takes the complete field of view and synthesizes it with, with CGI. The, the HoloLens on top is the AR, it augments information on top of the, the room that you see. In both cases, it's very important to be very real time because that motion parallax piece that we were talking about, our, our brain expects visual information to change instantaneously when our head moves around. You can do it that way. You can do it in the middle. You can walk into a VR cave. I'm sure many of this audience have been, had the opportunity to walk into a cave and experience that. And that's just an amazing, just an amazing experience. But it costs a fortune, right? It's certainly not something that you could expect to deploy broadly. And the last choice is this. The last choice is what we did. We put it on the desk in front. So watch, watch these kids, watch these kids interacting with what this desktop VR kit system we call ZSpace. What I notice is that it's not the HMD reactions that you see on YouTube. It's not, these kids don't feel like they're standing on a plank, you know, after they've walked up, uh, uh, ridden up 80 floors and walking off the end of a building. They're, they're, they're right there. They're in that room with everybody else. But still, they're very surprised. The emotions I see that are the most common and I think the most meaningful are about, about discovery and exploration and surprise. That's, this is the key, and this is, this, is, this is where we took the business, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. For those of you who are trying to figure out how we have multiple people looking at the same screen, right? This is a TN panel. This is a 120 hertz full HD panel. You can see some of those glasses have tracker markers on them. So we know where some of those glasses are, and we don't even know where the other glasses are. The kid on the left, we don't even know. So we don't want him to get a stereo image because it would conflict with the perspective information, right? We're drawing the images based on the perspective of the, of the main person. So those images, we call them the follower glasses. We have driver glasses for the person who's got the track glasses and the stylus. And we've got passenger glasses, driver passenger glasses for the other kids that aren't tracked. And those glasses actually have the same lens in both eyes. So they are monoscopic glasses. So it helps with the perspective being wrong because it's, it's, it's monoscopic. So what is it behind those reactions? As I said, it's not the, it's not the oh my gosh, this is, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen, but there's a sufficient surprise there that you don't see when you just sit down in front of a laptop or hand a kid an iPad. There's something really, really magical. There's something really deep going on. And I'd like to spend a couple minutes to try to explore why we think that is. First, we're all used to this interaction that I mentioned earlier. We do it all the time. This is the, this is the way the world is. We've evolved over a bazillion of years ex expecting to be able to reach out and interact with our world. It's a, it's a 
really important piece, and that stylus adds a, a big, big part to it. And man's been using tools for a long, long time. So let's go back and look at the fossil evidence of the, of the evolution of cells that can, can detect light. Where, do, where did vision come from in the first place? It's half a billion years old. The first cells that kind of came together. And you can certainly see that it, it could be a competitive advantage to be able to, to detect light and be able to start to, as these cells form together and, the, and start to get lenses, that the eyes would be good for finding prey and food. And it makes, it makes all kinds of sense. So the, the vision, you, it, it, it's old. If you look at the fossil evidence around mammals, that's 200 million years old. And it turns out that every mammal has exactly two eyes. And that's been true since from, from day number one. And you might ask yourself, why is it that we and every other mammal have exactly two eyes? In fact, virtually all complex life has exactly two eyes. And so why is that? Why is it not three? Why is it not one? I think, I think this audience appreciates well too. Two is good for the, for the binocular information to get depth information to extract that instantaneously from the scene. So why not a third? And the answer is that it's expensive. It's metabolically expensive. It takes a lot of energy. That's a, there's a lot of brain that's, uh, that's committed to the, to the vision part of our visual system. So three is just too much. The benefit is not worth what you get out of it. So for 200 million years, all, all mammals have been running around with two eyes. For 40,000 years, let's take that as, let's, let's call that the beginning of modern man. Let's, 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 let's define modern man as culture, art, music. So man, as we all look today, they've been running around with two eyes, dealing with the world, reaching out, picking things up, using tools for, a, for every day for a long, long time until not very long ago. Or actually, all day today, you've been, you, when you woke up and you reached over and hit that alarm clock and grabbed a cup of coffee, driving around, doing whatever you're doing, you're, you're, you're interacting with this world in front of you. By the way, these, the, back, back to the interaction piece just for a minute, our eyes are separated by six and a half centimeters, and that turns out to give you very good spatial, spatial resolution right about the length of your arm. So it's a pretty good design. Working out here and doing things like this is a pretty natural thing, and it's been going on for a long time. And we use that amazing visual perceptive system we have all the time until you know, we look at flat screens. <clears throat> and I mean to say flat in a, in a pretty derogatory way. I think, it's, I think it's been limiting for a long time. We have these screens in all these different sizes that, that, that uh, you know, we're carrying these powerful computers around in our, in our pocket. These, these machines do different things for us at different times. We do these different jobs, different tasks, depending on where we are, what we're trying to accomplish. Um, um, and it makes sense. It, but is it, is it the most natural way to interact with these computers? I don't think so. To me, it seems like an artificial representation, given what we were just talking about, about how we're, we, we deal with this spatial world naturally. If you're going to write a paper, you sit down and do it on a, on a big screen. You're not going to tap it out on this little thing. If you're, going to, if you're an artist and you want to do some work, you use a, one of these Wacom or competitive digitizer tablets, and you pick up that pen and you, and, you, and, you, and you write on a thing. And I think that makes a lot of sense. That's an interface that makes a lot of sense. And if you're going to draw a flat image, that's the way you do it. Makes a lot of sense. But it, the, a lot of it doesn't seem very natural. In fact, you can make a case, a pretty strong case, that all of that is a pretty unnatural way to deal with, deal with computers. So back to this seal. You saw him before. Let, let's, let's talk about his brain for a minute. This is an interesting, this seal is from Antarctica. I may have misspelled it, excuse me. I, but but this, uh, this seal is interesting because uh, uh, in all mammals, this seal is born with a brain that is 75% of an adult-sized brain at birth. Biggest among all mammals. And uh, uh, for reference, our brains are 25% of the full size at birth. So why is that? Why did nature decide, oh, we gotta give the seal a big brain? Because it, that's expensive. That's expensive, again, from a metabolic point of view. Its mother has gotta nurse this pup, and that brain takes a lot of energy right at birth. So what's the deal? 
The deal is there's a couple things. One is in not too many months, this seal is going to be off hunting by itself. The mother's, the mother's going to leave this thing in, I think, something like six months. So it needs to, be, needs to mature relatively quickly. But I think the more pertinent part to, th- to this discussion is that this, this seal and its mother, they live in a very complex spatial world. Very soon after birth, this seal is going to go hunting with mom uh, under the ice, through a hole. And in some number of months, they're going to be down there for 30 minutes, 40 minutes hunting. And uh, they've got to find their way back. So living in a very spatially complex world has dictated that this seal have these very advanced spatial navigational capabilities, which means you've got to have a big brain and all the, all the expense that goes along with that right out of the gate. How does that apply here? It applies, I think, because we're kind of like that too. Maybe, maybe we weren't born with all of the spatial abilities that, that, kind of we, that, that, we, that we kind of have, have now. But we don't use them when we look at all of these flat screens. We don't use those spatial abilities. The, the... So at ZSpace, we've been, we've been venture funded for for eight or nine years, something like that. We've been down here in the Bay Area for a long time. It took us a long time to make this stuff work. And we, made it, we, we kind of made it work. We put those pieces together that I told you about and said, okay, now what are we gonna do with it? Because as startup companies, you don't get a lot of choices, a lot of, a lot of chances, I should say. You don't get to try very many markets. So we had to pick a market for this stuff. So we said, oh, how about the, how about the education market? Oh, by the way, it's expensive. We sell these things in groups of 10 or 12 and, and you know, with software and installation, it's, it's a big deal. So we thought, oh, let's go to the education market where the, the, the common knowledge is there's not a lot of money in education, particularly in public education. Let's sell this brand new leading edge technology from a company nobody's ever heard of. The school officials are public officials. They're spending public money. They're, they're take, to some degree, they're taking a risk on this brand new technology. It's supplemental technology, which is expensive. And it's a risk because they could buy Apple or Windows or, and, and nothing would go wrong. So the, 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 the part of the funding, the part of the venture funding is the venture capitalists. And the venture capitalists told us that's a crazy idea. How, how are you going to go in there and sell expensive, brand new technology into the in, into, into into classrooms? And so, but we did, and we tried it a few years ago. Now we committed ourselves. We bet the company on it a few years ago, and now we've doubled the business for a few years in a row. And none of those things are none of those things are changed. It's still relatively leading edge technology. The, the, but but it's growing like crazy because of those reactions that you saw. The kids, because, because it turns out that, that, that the kids love it, the parents love it, the administrators love it. So some of the schools buy it because they say, oh, this is the future. We need to teach our kids about this kinds of things. Some, kids, some, some, some schools buy it because the kids are just engaged and they're paying attention and they're, they're really interested. We think that this is the... 15 hype cycle. Yeah, virtual VR in, in, in 14 was down here at the bottom of the trough of disillusionment. Are you guys all, you're all familiar with this? This is, this, is the, this, is the, this is the expectations on the left, on, on, on the y-axis here, about emerging technologies. So often, right, the expectations are big, 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 big. When it hits a market, there's a big disappointment. It doesn't really do everything that you know, ex- expecting it with the market says, oh, this isn't exactly right. Like, like uh, voice recognition took a long time. There was so much hype about voice recognition. And now it's only recently that half of you are using Siri or OK Google or Echo, Amazon, uh, Alexa, I have to call it Echo. Yeah. So um, this is the 15. So virtual VR has is, is, is been here and now it's moved over. And I think in 16 they pushed it out even a little more. And this is the, what is this, slope of enlightenment. So, and out there a little while, uh, like technologies get mature and everybody buys it, right? So, I think the HMDs, I think this is a little misleading. I don't know if I completely agree with this. I think if you take those HMDs and you put them in the, in the VR category, I think you find out that, you know, it might still be in the, 
in that trough. I think with all the hype that was going on a few years ago, a couple of years ago about HMDs, and now if you look at the real sales numbers, I think, you've, I, I think it, they would probably all agree too. Okay, maybe it's not really coming out of it. But the fact that we've been doubling this business in VR for a few years uh, in education is, is, is proof. <clears throat> I think it's, 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 it's proof the market has spoken and said, hey, we want this stuff. We're willing to pay this money for this stuff. We're, we think that there is a future in this technology, and, and, and we want to do it. And it's, it's, as you saw, it's public schools all over the country. So I want to I compare it in some ways to color TV, to the adoption of color TV. And this problem, if you, if you look at how this happened, it's almost hard, it's almost hard to, it's very hard for me to understand how it happened. Because, you know, everybody had black and white TVs, all the production was in black and white, all the transmission was in black and white, everything was in black and white. And then some engineers, you know, I'm sure, worked out two or three ways that they could, you know, build color cameras, color transmission systems, so, that, so color TV was a possibility. But how do you make it happen? How do, you, how, do you, how, do you, how do you get every consumer on the planet to have color TV and never look back and never think that, that they would ever want to watch black and white TV again? Because it's a, huge, it's a huge cost to change all the cameras, all the production, all the storage, transmission, to agree on the standards, and to get everybody to buy a color TV. How do you do that? And, and think about the chicken and egg of, of all the TV sets and all the equipment and, and all the content. Because, of course, you can't sell any TVs if there's no content. And, and why would you make content if there are no TVs? Let me plant the seed for a little bit. But, but this, it happened, it happened, if nothing else, because it's a preference. If you're going to watch I Love Lucy in black and white, and you're going to watch I Love Lucy in color, it's the same thing, right? You you get almost the same experience. I would argue there's nothing you can do in color TV that you can't do in black and white TV. You could make that case with our stuff. You could make that case with the kids in, in, in schools and say, oh, there's nothing you can do in VR or this version of desktop VR that you can't do on an iPad or on a PC right in front of you. But it turns out that the, 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 there are plenty of people who are looking at it, and because of the, the arguments I was making earlier about the complexities of our, the, 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 the very complex evolution of our spatial visual system, that there are some things that are better. It's more than just a preference, even though with color TV, preference was enough. So the, the military has been interested for a long time, of course, and uh, it turns out that, that pilots, when presented with binocular information, can make, can make determinations you know, quicker. That's important. Um, there are a number of studies that are starting in and starting to come, come through in education actually, in, uh, spurred on by all the hype about, about HMDs, and they're showing that kids learn better. That's a fantastic thing. Kids, why would kids learn better? I think for the same kind of reasons. It's using a bunch of your brain the way it was designed to be used. So they talk about really complex learning theory like uh, cognitive load and a couple other, a couple other things that I can't even remember. It's, it's very complex, it's very, very, very interesting science, the study of learning. But one big case is where if you can just see information in front of you and just let that part of your brain that's designed to do that, use that information the way you, you wanna use it, then you've got, you know, you're not, you're not using other parts of your brain to set up this kind of structural scene in front of you and sort it all through. It's kind of like, would you rather, if you, you can be a radiologist and, and today you get trained to look at these 2D slices, right? Do all this work. Or you could use something like this, which on a, some kind of VR system in front of you, you just see all the information synthesized, some sort of ray tracing voxel application where it's just giving you information that's presented in a way that is compatible with your visual system. In fact, this application is called EchoPixel, and it was approved by the FDA for diagnostic radiology running on 
running on our system. And that's a pretty strong statement. That says, well, at least this is at least as good as, as the old way, but you should, uh, you should come try it. I mean, you, should, you, should, you should stop by and see it tomorrow. It's almost night and day to see the slices. Although, you can go back and forth in the application. It makes a lot of sense. But just seeing, especially stuff that's about that size, that's about life size, just right in front of you where you can look around and look through it, is really, really powerful. Here's a quick little story about how it uh, applied to us when we were developing the display technology some years ago. Um, <clears throat> You know, we're all uh, cranking away on MATLAB. One of the engineers was looking at some error data in I think it was gray to gray levels in one of the, one of the displays. And he was uh, sitting in, his, in front of his PC and he was, he, he, hey Dave, can you, can, you, can you see this? Can you see, can you see that? And I said, gee, we gotta, we gotta get that data in, you know, get that data in ZSpace. We gotta get that data in ZSpace. So one day he came back and said, okay, I did it. What? Yeah, I put it in. I got it, uh, I got it out of MATLAB. I did what I needed to do. I did the processing, and it was pretty hard. The path was a lot harder to get data in to visualize it some few, three, four years ago. But we got this data in, and then I, when I walked over to, to talk about it, there was a whole crowd of engineers around us, and th th they were just astounded by data that we'd, we'd all been looking at already. But then there it was in front of us, just, just, thin, and, and, and things are just jumping out. Back to that same piece, that same piece about um, um, taking advantage of these abilities that we have. So, did I make a mistake? Here we go. So, uh, back, back to the color TV thing. One thing I really liked about this picture is they just, uh, uh, in this ad here, there's so much going on. NBC Big Color TV. They just didn't even finish taking, out of the, taking it out of the box. That's how easy it needs to be from the consumer side. So if you want to talk about adoption, let's say, okay, we think, we think there are lots of applications for this kind of interactive environment space. If you want it to be adopted, there's a, there's a handful of things you've got to do, and one of them is you can't ask very much of the customers. You can only ask as much of the customers that, is, that it's got to be less than whatever it is they're going to get out of it, right? So here, mom just didn't even finish unboxing the TV. Dad, yeah, dad's in there too. Just open it up and just watch TV. If it's a black and white show that's on TV, it works. If it's a, if it's a color TV show, it works. It's just kind of what you're doing. It's just incrementally better, and it wasn't that hard for them wasn't that hard for the end customer. So if we go back to all these devices that we're all carrying around and all the things that we do all the time, right? It seems to me that it makes sense for when, 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 when you're working on a display that's got some kind of geometry where you might be able to enjoy or appreciate some of the experiences like we've been talking about, it'd be nice if it just worked. Why couldn't it just work? It brings us to the web. This is a really exciting piece of, the, of, of what's going on with this technology that we're, that we're putting together. You've all heard of WebGL, I'm sure. Well, let me back up. The, 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 the web browser technology over the years has been getting closer and closer to the hardware. By that I mean there's not a lot of overhead in between. The browser can drive the machine and get a lot of capabilities, most of the capabilities out of the hardware. WebGL is a piece that is... is, is is a library, an interface, a bunch of JavaScript APIs so that the browser can drive the GPU. Yeah? Scene.js, 3.js, those are JavaScript libraries to let you build 3D environments, right? And, and WebVR is, is an effort that's been underway to allow the web browser and uh, WebGL to, to interact with VR devices, that is, HMDs and input devices that type of thing. Unity, Unreal, they both have targets in their environments that target WebGL. So what does that mean? That means you should, why not just let people do what they do on the web, and then when they get to some place on the web that can support this magic stuff, it should just happen. So here it is. We've been working with Google and these 
web VR, web GL guys for, for a year or so. I'm moving this page around to just show you that it, this really is a, a Chrome browser. They really, I mean, it's just a browser that we all know and love. And then I've gone to a few pages that are out here that have been loaded over the web. And now I, I, I didn't use Andrew's uh, uh, fantastic stereo display technology, but I can appreciate, I can, I, I can uh, lean on your expertise here so that you can imagine that this is indeed is in stereo. It, it, you can tell things are, things are moving around a little bit because when I filmed it, I was, I was wearing the glasses. So I'm, I'm, I'm moving it a, a little bit with the, with the stylus, but I was wearing the glasses. Here's another page from a partner of ours, BioDigital. And this is a WebGL uh, app running uh, using Scene.js. And the exciting here, thing here is this is a web page. And when you see it, if you wander by and see it tomorrow, uh, you're really going to be surprised. I reloaded it here just to show you how long it took over our, my, uh, the Wi-Fi network in my office. So that was a, a few seconds to get this much information down over, over the web. So the idea is, uh, let me, here's a, I found a Jenga game out there in 3JS. It's running on a, a JavaScript physics engine. Right? We wrap some stuff around it to add the stereo view and the stylus interaction, and we got that. It took, I don't know, I'm not that good at it. It took me a few days, but it shouldn't, it, should, it would take someone really good at it, not very long. Here's more biodigital information out there on the web. So if you just take one of our systems and you take uh, this version of Chrome that supports this, you just load this page and this is what you get. Here's another page that give you a good idea that to, to, to believe that you could run simulations and training. You could run, uh, you, you could teach people things pretty well with this. And the idea is you have to kind of think back to that first image that I showed you where it had, it had that uh, kid kind of pulling the heart out of the, out of the page. It's like that. It's like this stuff is in this volume right in front of you. Here's a wiki page. <clears throat> and just looking more and more like the web, I'm gonna talk to you about what it takes to do that. That OBJ embedded in a uh, uh, HTML5 page is, is really not, not a big deal and pretty exciting. And then this is a, another web page uh, uh, created by Unity. This is a Unity application that's been overlaid on top of the HTML5 text, which gives you, uh, by the way, this works fine if you just want to do it the regular way. This is like kind of, this would be like watching a, a black and white show. Just do it like this. But you might come upon a page like this and, and, and you, might decide, you might see that something is there, put on the glasses, and then you can pull things out of this. And then just let me show you a couple more. This is an, another version of the Chrome browser running right behind something else. So this is less a direct uh, uh, demonstration of the Chrome browser itself and a little more futuristic about what, we, what, what we're trying to show. But it looks a lot like the wiki page, doesn't it? It's a Mayo Clinic page with a, with a brain. Um, here's a shopping idea. There's some that say that e-commerce might be the real killer app with this kind of technology. Pull out, some, pull out something, customize it. If people look at the, the cycles it takes and the kind of purchasing cycle of what it takes for people to buy something, that you, know, you can get, get interested and l learn more about it. And this, it's, it's possible that this could take you through that cycle a lot quicker. Here's an eBay page. We took this with just with an SLR and, and, the, and that, that, that uh, object was on a Lazy Susan. We just spun it around and then we just present a couple of 2D images. And then here's a suggestion of social media. Same kind of thing for that food. You know, people, you, people wave their phone around food and, and post it on social media. Everything I've shown you so far has been mostly uh, uh, pretty basic interactions, but you can imagine an, uh, a simulation where you shake that bottle and it fizzes up and you could spill it onto the, spill it onto the food.
So this is coming pretty fast, we think. We're going to be showing more of this stuff at, uh, at GDC this year. We are, uh, uh, it's, it turns out the timing is perfect. It turns out that those, those groups, those uh, uh, standards bodies, have been working on integrating and enabling VR into the browsers for some time. And so these things are coming together at just the right time. The idea is, for a developer point of view, for what might be thousands or tens of thousands or maybe more web developers out there, the idea is that we try to make it not very difficult to get some kind of experience. So take that shoe there, for example. Let's say you're, uh, uh, you've got an eBay store and you want to you sell that shoe. It's not very difficult. You can wave your phone around things. You can, have you seen this it sees 3D thing. This is an occipital scanner on an iPad. You really can just walk around. He's you just walk around that woman, and then it's pretty smart. It can make a local OBJ file in a minute or two on the iPad, or it takes of some series of images that it captured when it was running around, sends it up to the cloud, and then five minutes later you get a really nice version which is a, a high quality mesh with textures. And even this, this product on the right is a uh, HP Sprout 2. And it has, uh, in addition, I believe it's got an Intel RealSense camera up on top. Uh, you can move objects around underneath it and it kind of subtracts out the hand and builds a, a model That, that's suitable for something like this to say drop into your, into your eBay page. The idea is that we're, gonna, we're making it, working with the standards groups, making it really easy for the web development community to make some modest changes and achieve what is a pretty, pretty big impact. And then, if you go further, that heart, that beating heart is a, is a different matter, of course. There's all kinds of animations and there was annotations, that type of thing. So that's about, that is what I had to say. I think this is about preference. This is about utilizing our capabilities. This is about not, it's, all, it's, it's almost about not accepting the flatness of, of screens that we're, so, that we're so used to. I'll, uh, I'll finish with a little, little story. My, uh, a buddy of mine was, did, uh, uh, talking to his daughter, his teenage daughter, about uh, how they used to watch, how he and his wife used to watch Friends on TV. You know, the, the sitcom Friends, right? It was, I don't know, it was Thursday nights at 8 or something like that. And he, used to, he, he said, yeah, we used, to, we used to all come home and we'd have our friends over and we'd watch this, we'd watch this television show together. And, and uh, she was looking at him quizzically, you know, why? And he said, yeah, well, you know, people would just come over at the right time. And, and um, she, it, it was so far removed from her understanding of the way that kids consume content today that she looked at him and said, why, why, why did they design it like that? I think that kids are, when this happens, I think kids are going to look back, look at us, and say, why did you do it that way? Why did you, why did you, why was everything so flat? Why, why, why didn't you just reach in and grab things? Anyway, thanks, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Dave. Are there any questions from the audience? I can just comment on the um, introduction of color TV because it, it's a really interesting piece of history. It's um, 18 years from the first color TV broadcast to half of US households having a color TV. So 18 years to get half of households. Because black and white TV was just really, really fast. So it's that problem of replacing what you had. And what, the, what they think kicked it off, because it just bounced along with very, few, very low uptake for years, was when one of the US TV channels committed to primetime TV being in color. And that's what kicked it off. And from that point to half of US households was seven years. 
So the seven-year rule seems to be... Was it possible, too, that that company also owned the equipment, had an yeah. equipment business, too, like a, like a set business? Yeah, like it could have been NBC, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's amazing that it happened. And it, indeed, it took a long time, right? So we look here and say, gee, what if, it, what if it's not very difficult to just incrementally modify the web to, to, to allow this? And then... And it's the other thing about the web is you don't have to, you don't really have to predict what that killer app is going to be. Maybe it's going to be shopping. Maybe it's going to be some casual game. Maybe it's going to be some health thing. But but at least it can come. And then there's no more. And then the broadcast times that things were limited by time and by geography, right? But but now you put something on a web, it's available all the time, any any place. Thanks. That was yeah. Thanks for this <coughs> amazing talk. So um, I think what is so one question is, why didn't you talk about this um, amazing high um, density? So if you, if you use a, if you use a, the pen, the stylus pen, I mean, it's um, if you compare it to the technology which is usually usually, uh, usually used with the HMDs, it's very very precise. So when I used it the first time, I was very surprised about this. So this may be my first question. Maybe you can comment on that. Oh yeah. Well, I think. Well, thanks for that. Uh, uh, I think the piece that's important is we're just so used to using our hands and reaching in and, and interacting with the world in front of us, and the pen allows us to do that. Um, and one piece I didn't mention is that I was, we're talking about the instantaneous uh, motion parallax and how important it is for, for zero lag. One nice, nice thing about that, the pen in your hand is that you get that sense of grounding right away, right? Because it's, it's just available all the time. From, on, 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 you're, you're very kind about the performance of the, of the stylus. From my point of view and from the point of view of our engineering team, we'll, all we see are the flaws, and we just, we're just trying to make it better and better. So, yeah, yeah. Mm. so and uh, I think the other thing, uh, sorry, <laughs> just re run me a remark about the value of this machine. I think if you compare to HMDs, um, can somebody think about to use in a, in a school class, for example, 30 HMDs? So who will take care for this 30 HMDs? So with, with 30 cables, and so I think there's no teacher in the world who will be able to work with that. And I think this is one thing why, why this space is, is very strong in the education sector, because I don't think it will come in the end that you will have a class with yeah, 30 of HMDs and plus a technical assistant who is able to take care for this in the future. But with this space, this would be possible, I think. I think that's a fair comment. I mean, the, the uh I think you need a broad range of different solutions to deliver different products for different situations. And um, yeah, uh, HMDs aren't always going to be the solution. So it's good to have different options. I had a question, David. Um, I noticed that uh, ZSpace is having a bit of a road show at the moment. It's got some trucks set up. Um, how's that sort of uh, going? Yeah, I should. Because it's so important to see it, we discovered, we, 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 we took a bus and we put eight or ten systems in that bus and we drive it around from school district to school district. We tried that a couple of years ago and it was incredible because not only did, did uh, uh, superintendents and teachers and get to experience, but then sometimes they would say, can we bring some kids in? And then they would really see, see the faces light up. So now we have four of those buses or something like that. We have a, to, 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 to make those numbers that you saw, we have a, a sales force across the country and we're, we're visiting school districts and we're, so it takes, and it really is somehow with, with VR and, and, and our technology in particular, you really have to see it to, to appreciate what it's like. In fact, I, I really invite you to, to uh, come by tomorrow night and have a peek. Hey, I, ch I give you a challenge. I get in the grumpiest mood you can find. S skip the drink, hold on to the drink coupon. Come visit, come take a look at this thing. And if you can keep a straight face, then you know, I'll buy you a drink. Because what's gonna happen is you're, 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 you'll, you'll get a little smile because you can't help it because it's, it's just so, it's, it's so surprising that it's so ingrained in all of us that the that screens do this and then you're going to see something else that's kind of so surprising and natural that Andrew might invite me to come, you know, give a talk about it. How about okay. that? Okay, drinks are on, David. <laughs> okay. So 5.30 tomorrow night, remember. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Hi. So I think the Z-Space have done a great job here over many years. 
So I'm sorry? You've done a great job over many years. Ah, thank so, you. a very nice product. Um, I wonder why more people don't use it, actually, because it, the times I've seen it, it does just work. But you didn't say very much about the software interfaces for the device. So how many different ways of coding are there for us to use it? Today, it's a SDK on top of Windows. Um, the most popular environment is Unity. We have a plugin for Unity. It's a, a prototype to drop in the stereo camera, so it replaces the one camera with a stereo camera. So you get the you get the head track stereo really almost for free. And then the stylus interaction has more to do with the design of the UI in your application. Um, most of the content that we see and that we use in in schools is is coming from Unity. I think I can say that safely. So. Yes, that's where we are today, and as we, we look ahead, it, it still might come from Unity, but it might come over this WebGL target. So w what if we want to code it at a low level ourselves? Is there a low level API in there? Please do, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. You want to write an OpenGL app and, and go after it, we've got, we've got all that for you too, yep. Yeah. yeah, and a number of people have. It's, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's tough to compete with the, this full-featured environment that where you just kind of drag things around and boom, you have your have your scene. But but for the certainly that medical application, Echo Pixel, that was done natively. What sort of interaction and and support is there for the development community? I know that Bjorn's been doing a lot of work with ZSpace, and uh, um, how would other groups um, tie into that? Yeah, it's a. Uh, uh, we have a developer support group. We have a, a, a whole developer relations effort. It happens mostly, we do it a couple ways. We, to, to try to get, to, to jumpstart the education market, we went out toward education content companies who had content. We thought, okay, when we, when we work with them to try to port it over to ZSpace. We needed to create some mass of content that would make it valuable for schools, mm -hmm. right? On the other side, we've you know we've got this SDK on top of Windows. We've been working working on the web groups, and we're start just starting to talk about and publicize more kind of what's possible. At, uh, as a startup company, we we were forced to pick a market, as I said, and that education market is where we're trying to put almost all of our energy. So Bjorn was saying, "Hey, why don't you support me better and you know higher ed?" And I'm well, okay, I'm I want to, <laughs> but it's hard. It's hard to it's it's. Uh, we feel like there's such broad applications for this stuff that as a small company, it'd be very dangerous to, to look too many places, yeah. right? So well, um, trying to all, first of a, a few years ago, it was can we prove that there's a market that will pay for this stuff? And now we're quite proud of that. And I, it's, it's, it's opening up a bunch more doors. This, this, this work with, with the web is, is, is all brand new, I think, because we've shown that there's fundamental value in this. So we will be looking to, to expand the platform to, to more, make it, make it available. And it, yes, it needs to make commercial sense for them too, right? Unless they're just researchers. Mm -hmm. But if it needs to make commercial sense for somebody to, to go out and do it. And, then, and that doesn't make, it doesn't make commercial sense like, unless you can have the promise of, you know, seats. Thanks for a very interesting talk. Uh, I'm Taka Shibata from Tokyo University of Social Welfare. Uh, I'm really interested in the education using 3D images. Uh, what, what kind of uh, educational materials or coursework uh, suits for this space? We have some, we, we seeded the, the uh, market with a couple of applications. One uh, teaches Newtonian mechanics, we call it Newton's Park. We have another one called Curie's Elements. You, know, you want to guess? It's uh, chemistry. We show the periodic table and you can pop up elements and see the uh, electron probability clouds and uh, it's a uh, look at the table different ways. And even though the periodic table seems like a flat thing, actually when you start looking at atoms and their interactions, it's... Uh, we have another one about electricity. Teachers came to us and said, oh, it's very difficult for us to, to, to teach kids how an electric motor works, how a DC motor works. So you can pull up this motor and you can see the electrons flowing through the brushes and, the, and the, the, the magnetic coils and you can pull a pin out and it stops moving. And so there are those few. Um, there are, there's kind of cell biology. We have some third party apps that teach kids all kinds of uh, anatomy and, and um, uh, science relative to life sciences. And there's a 
handful of others. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your next talk. I'm Kim Nong from Edwin Korea. In the picture on the screen, they, they're not wearing special glasses. So is that your next step to that? Uh, to I to knew that? somebody was going to catch that. <laughs> Uh, this is a pretty futuristic picture, don't you think? We, got, we have a bunch of kids looking at one screen with no glasses. So not only is that auto stereoscopic, I mean, that, oh, that's, a, that's a real holographic display. And I haven't seen anything that comes anywhere close. In fact, so, but I think certainly this, this, this day will come. Reaching in without having to hold the stylus even, just, just kind of gestures and with, and with no glasses. You can imagine if it really gets this easy, it'll even make it into smaller screens. But back to the, something I said a, a lot earlier, that's gotta be worth, that benefit's gotta be worth the cost that the consumer's gotta pay to, to carry that around. It's heavier, probably uses more power, it's, uh, and the optics have gotta be pretty compelling to, to um, is that our next product? No. Well, sometimes I dream about that. Sometimes I dream about that. Well, um, in the stereoscopic literature, human factors types of problems with the mismatch between where the image is, uh, the diopter distance of the screen, and where they're converging out here, if everything's out in front of the screen, has anybody talked to you about these concerns, have any of the users expressed any uh, discomfort due to the mismatch between focusing distance and fixation distance? Yeah, so this is the, this is the accommodation vergence issue, right? right? So we know Marty Banks, we've uh, uh, worked with him for a while. Uh, specifically, I don't think, the, I don't think these our customers would know enough to know that oh I'm 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 not comfortable with this thing because I'm focusing here but I'm verging over here right so but we are so we but we pay a lot of attention we have a lot of kids who come in in all kinds of different states of of uh, sleep and 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 uh, by far a much bigger factor is the content is the quality of the content we think first second. Uh, we have some advantage here because, the, because of the interaction device, the user is in control. So if the user pulls something out too far, maybe they consciously don't even know that it's not comfortable, but they, they're getting it. They're starting to get some cues inside. So they just kind of push it back. So we think the fact that the, 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 the user has control kind of extends this, uh, this zone of comfort that you would normally get. It's one that uh, uh, Marty Banks has been studying for, his lab has been studying for quite some time. But that as yet is, is unproven. Um, maybe I have a couple other thoughts about it, but I'd love to catch up if, if you like. Okay, any other questions from the audience? Well, we've had a good Q&A session there, so I think at this point we'll uh, put our hands together and thank David Chavez for his great presentation.